Thank you. Bless you. Ah, let the next class get it. Time is up, time is up. And that's it. Thank you. Hi, I just want to, I, uh, Josh, you know last set. Yep. Yep, it's done. Yep, sorry. You gotta catch the TA. Yeah. Come on in, get settled in. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, folks. Okay, get settled in, please. Okay, the, the usual rules apply. Folks, okay. the usual rules apply. The quizzes are graded. I will let you know. You can come pick them up. I will not put the solutions up till the quizzes are graded because if you check the solutions, your worst case scenarios will unfold in your head. <laughs> so, so wait about it. It will be sooner than you think. The quizzes will be ready. You can pick them up. You can check the solutions. If I've screwed up, you can bring it in. Please don't take it to the TAs. They have nothing to do with this. Absolutely nothing. Okay, so if there's a screw up, it's my fault. Bring it in and I'll fix it. Yeah. Question? <laughs> if I made the quizzes 45 minutes, I'd give you a different kind of quiz. Okay. That's the, I, I, I'm not sure you want that, to be quite honest. I'm going to give you a two-hour final. And you're going to wish it was a 30-minute quiz. Hey, there's a long way to do every problem and there's a short way to do every problem. As I was walking by, I saw a lot of you use the long way to do pretty much every problem. You will not get through things in 30 minutes. I'll give you an example. On 2C, what is the question? What effect will there be on net present value if you expense an item rather than do what you did, capitalize in depreciation? 
I notice at least a third of you work through the entire problem with the expensing option. You don't have to. Remember, we, we talked about this. When something changes, focus on what changes. What's the tax benefit from expensing? It's immediate. So if I spend a million dollars and I get the tax benefit right now, I get a $400,000 tax benefit today. What do I gain if I depreciate it over five years? I get 200000 a year, 40% of that. So basically all I have is one tax benefit up front of 400000 versus $80,000 in tax benefits each year for the next five years. Take the present value of the second, that's it. The difference is the net present value effect. If you work it through the long way, it is going to take you an extra seven minutes. Okay? On, the, on the first problem, what, what was the... What was the question? It was about getting a rupee cost of equity for a retail business in India that it was going to be, how was it going to be funded? All equity. all equity. So why did I give you all the debt numbers, the lease commitments, and the equity? Why didn't you need those? You, you did need them. They were not extraneous information because you have to unlever the existing beta. Once you get the unlevered beta, there's no debt, there's no cost of debt. You're done. It's the same business, right? So. If you went looking for an unlevered beta for the retail business, it was hidden in the numbers because this is already a retail company. The beta was already there. Okay? So it's, that's the only, that was the, the time consuming stuff. Okay, don't say we. Talk about yourself. You need more time, that is fine. So in a sense, let's talk about what might be taking up time because a third of the people in this class finish the quiz on time. So it's, we is a kind of tough word, right? Because it means that everybody is not finishing. And that's not the case. People are finishing, so some people clearly are able to get through steps faster than others. It's not because they're, they're it might not be because they're smarter or no more. It just might be that they're using some time-saving processes along the way. So let's talk about what's taking up time. Because the way I do the quiz is I write the quiz and then I send it to the TAs and ask them how much time it takes them to do the quiz. Then I double the time. Okay. But that's my process for deciding whether the quiz is too much or too little is that's the process. That's what I've always done. So in a sense, 30 minutes is, I know, it's if you panic for six minutes that 20% of the quiz is gone. Okay. That's the problem. It's 30 minutes, and any lack of focus in 30 minutes is going to mean that you're going to have trouble finishing the quiz. So if you're having trouble consistently missing entire questions, missing a part of a question, that's, it, it, it's going to happen. In 30 minutes, I'm going to write questions where you are, in fact, it's open book, open notes. If I gave you three hours on the quiz, you should get a perfect score because you have enough time to go look up everything. So. The 30 minutes is going to put a crimp on how much you can look up during the course of the quiz. But enough about the quiz. You're going to get it back. It's another sunk cost. Let it go. It's done. Nothing you can do about it at this point in time. Okay. Let's talk a little bit more about the trade-off between debt and equity. If you, you notice the U.S. Treasury has come up with new plans to stop inversions. And in fact, I've created a puzzle around it. It's actually a fascinating story. Because it's actually the entire set of plans were designed, I think, to stop one big merger, the pfizer allergan merger. And it worked, because this morning Pfizer announced that it was calling off the merger. Is that good news or bad news if you're a Pfizer stockholder? It's really bad news if you're an Allergan stockholder. That was no-brainer. Today, watch Pfizer stock price, because that's going to tell you whether the market actually bought into this hype of this being this great deal for Pfizer. I never thought it was a great deal. I'm a Pfizer stockholder. I am happy the deal fell apart because I think they were paying too much, notwithstanding the tax benefits. So we'll see what the stock price does today because it'll be an interesting exercise in whether the market bought into this hype from Pfizer managers that this deal was going to change Pfizer as a company. Okay? We, so the, the benefits and costs of debt, as we set them up, tax benefit added, discipline on the other side, on one side, bankruptcy cost, agency cost, and loss of future flexibility in the other. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put you in a hypothetical. Scenario. And as I go through this, I want you to think about the trade-off. Okay? So here's what happens. You wake up tomorrow in a world, and here's what this world looks like. 
Nobody pays taxes, so it's like Greece. Okay. But there you're supposed to, but you don't pay taxes. So this is a world where nobody has to pay tax, so it's more like Bermuda. Managers have stockholders' best interests at heart when they make decisions. So it's not that they never make mistakes, but that they don't take bad projects knowing they're taking bad projects. Third, no firm in this world ever goes bankrupt. So there's no default risk. Equity investors are honest in this world. So when you go to the bank and describe a project, if it's a risky project, you describe it as a risky project. And every firm in this world knows its future financing needs with complete certainty. So think about the trade-off, right? Tax benefits, added discipline. Let me go through item by item. You tell me in this world what happens to each item. Let's start with tax benefits. What are the tax benefits from debt going to look like in this world? This, no taxes, no tax benefits. OK, that's, that was easy. What about added discipline? Managers already do the right thing. You don't need added discipline. They're already disciplined, so you don't need added discipline. Expected bankruptcy costs? Zero. No company ever goes bankrupt. Equity investors never lie. There's no agency problem because you're no, nobody's lying. And since everybody knows their future financing needs with certainty, who needs flexibility? You can make 10-year plans and not worry about them. So in this world, there are no tax benefits, no added discipline benefits, no expected bankruptcy costs, no agency costs, and nobody needs future flexibility. So what effect will debt have? on your value as a company. There's no benefits, no costs. So how much should you borrow? It doesn't matter. You've just derived corporate finance's most famous theorem. It's called the Miller-Modigliani theorem. And here's what the Miller-Modigliani theorem says. In a world with no taxes, no default risk, and no agency costs, it does not matter how much you borrow. Merton Miller and Franco Modigliani won the Nobel Prize about a decade ago for this. And this is actually the paper that gave birth to corporate finance as a discipline, the 1958 paper. You know one of the great tragedies of the Miller Modigliani theorem is? Generations of business school students have gone through school. If you ask them what's the only thing you remember about your capital structure lecture, they'll say it's the Miller Modigliani theorem. How convenient. I don't remember any of this stuff, but it doesn't matter anyway. In fact, I'm amazed at how much people hold on to the Miller-Modigliani theorem with the, and forget all about the assumptions you need to get there. I've talked to bankers. Say, Miller -Modigliani. They use Miller-Modigliani like garlic with a vampire. Whenever you talk about that, Miller-Modigliani, 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 back off, don't talk about it. To show you how insane this fixation of the Miller-Modigliani theorem sometimes is, I'll tell you a story. It's about we're one of the very first class, I, I think it was 1986, I taught a corporate finance class here, my first corporate finance class. Somebody went through that class, graduated, went to work for an LBO outfit that was involved in the Federated deal. For those of you who don't remember that, that was the parent company for Bloomingdale's, and they did this leverage buyout of Bloomingdale's. And that always surprised me. Bloomingdale's is especially retail. You'd expect the earnings to be unstable. You would not expect it to be the kind of company you target in an LBO. And of course, the deal fell apart, partly because the person who did the deal was deranged. He was actually he was a guy called Robert Campwood. He was actually mentally unstable, but I guess he was a good deal maker. And the deal fell apart. And this private equity outfit, or the LBO outfit that he worked for, went bankrupt. So four or five years later, I run into him somewhere on Wall Street and ask him what he's doing. And he tells me, I'm working here. And then he says, I used to work for this outfit that did the LBO of Bloomingdale's, and I said, I was always surprised by that deal. Why would you pick a company like Bloomingdale's and borrow that much money? He said, don't you remember Milo Modigliani? Yeah, I, I said, yes. And he said, didn't they say it didn't matter how much you borrowed? I said, I'm glad you live in a world with no taxes and no default risk, but remind me again what happened to the outfit you used to work for? And without a trace of irony, he said, it went bankrupt. You see the irony here? He's talking about Miller Modigliani, and in the same breath, Miller Modigliani assumes that nobody defaults, and he's saying the outfit he worked for went bankrupt. The Miller Modigliani theorem is a great way to start thinking about debt, but it shouldn't be the way you end thinking about debt. In fact, in the Miller Modigliani world, 
The cost of capital for a company will remain the same, whether it has 0% debt, 20% debt, 40% debt, 60% debt, or 80% debt, because whatever you gain by borrowing money, you'll exactly offset with the cost of equity. Your cost of capital will be a flat line. It's an incredibly convenient theorem, because it means you don't ever have to worry about debt ratios. But it applies only in this very specific scenario. So let's get real. In the world that we live in, debt does matter. Companies do think about how much to borrow money, and there seems to be some kind of financing hierarchy. What am I talking about? That Most companies, if you ask them, if I gave you a choice as to how to raise money, how would you raise money, there are, there's a hierarchy that CFOs seem to take. And when you think about this hierarchy, and I'll show you that list, I'd like you to think about the two things that companies seem to value. The first is they value flexibility. They value being able to change their minds. And the second is, they value control. So keep that in mind as I show you the listing of what the preferred sources of financing are. So this is a survey. Companies are asked, if you had a choice of raising money, where would you go raise money first? Number one choice, retained earnings. Given a choice, companies like to fund everything with retained earnings. What's the advantage of retained earnings? You don't have to answer to anybody, right? Essentially, it's your own earnings. You put it back. The investors might say, I want more dividends, but you control the process and you get maximum flexibility. No covenants, nothing to worry about. Second on the list, trade debt. No special features added, no conversion features, straight debt. Third on the list is convertible debt. Fourth on the list is common stock. New stock issues to raise money. Fifth on the list is preferred stock, and at the very bottom of the hierarchy, is convertible preferred stock. You're saying, why is preferred stock worse than debt? What's the disadvantage of preferred stock relative to debt? Preferred stock, you have to pay a fixed dividend just like debt, right? Debt has an interest expense. But what's the difference? Within, with debt, when you make that interest expense, what do you get as a benefit? You get a tax benefit. Preferred stock is like very expensive debt. It is a stupid way of raising finance, if you ask me. But one of the reasons we talked about this, that banks especially like to use preferred stock, is for whatever reason, the way capital ratios are computed uses preferred stock as if it were equity. So it encourages them to go out and issue this very expensive debt because they have no other choice. So this is the hierarchy. And this is actually an interesting way to think about how much trouble a company is and by just looking at what kind of security they issue. Let me give you an example. In fact, when you see the, the, the effects of this, the hierarchy shows up in how US companies raise money. Predominant variable for raising money is internal financing, retained earnings. Next is new, new stock issues. And you can see it's tiny. And then you got bond issues. When you look at how US companies raise money to fund projects, you see that financing hierarchy play out. Mostly retained earnings. If you run out of retained earnings, you issue debt. If you don't have enough money, then you issue, issue common stock. You know what a tombstone ad is? You open up the Wall Street Journal, you'll see a company saying, we're raising financing. If you get a chance after the class today, open up the Wall Street Journal for today, find a tombstone ad. Look to see what kind of security a company is issuing. Because that alone will tell you how much trouble the company is in. Let me explain. Let's assume you open up the journal, you find a tombstone ad, and you see a company saying it's issuing convertible preferred stock. What does it tell you about the company's financial standing? Where, is, where did convertible preferred fall in the hierarchy? You're at the bottom of the barrel. Why are you going to the bottom of the barrel? Because everything else is off the table. So if you're a company in so much trouble that you don't have any retained earnings because you're losing money, nobody will buy your shares because they've been plummeting. Nobody will lend you money because they're worried about whether you'll pay them back. What are you left with? You're left with convertible preferred stock. Convertible preferred stock is an instrument of desperation. You're doing it because no other financing is working for you. So try that out. In fact, it's a very interesting way to look to see whether companies are in financial trouble, just to see what kind of security they're issuing to raise money. So now let's get specific. We've talked about the trade-off between debt and equity. Let's see if we can come up with more specific answers. What I mean by that is if I gave you the trade-off, you can talk about the pluses and the minuses. But then if I asked you, does that mean I should take 30% debt or 40% debt, you can say, I don't have an answer to that. So I want to give you at least a way of coming up with a more specific answer to the question, how much debt should I have? 
So what we're going to focus on is this right mix of debt and equity. I'm going to give you five different tools for finding the right mix of debt and equity for the company. And you can take your pick as to which one you find most useful. One I've already talked about. You tell me where your company is in the life cycle. I'll tell you what, how much debt to borrow. If you're a startup, you should have all equity. If you're a declining company, you should have more debt. Mature companies, lots of debt. But I'm going to give you the other four. I'm going to start off using something we've already used in a different context. Remember we computed the cost of capital for a company? We used it as a hurdle rate to decide whether to make investments or not. I'm going to go back to the tool and talk about how the cost of capital for a company can actually be used to decide what the right mix of debt and equity is for that company. It's actually the most commonly used tool to come up with the right mix of debt and equity if you're asked to come up with that mix. So I'm going to start with that. Then I'm going to point out some of the limitations of that tool. We make assumptions with the cost of capital approach that might not be defensible. So the second approach I'm going to call the enhanced cost of capital approach where I'm going to allow you to take care of some of those problems. The third approach is called the adjusted present value approach or the APV approach. In fact, if you went to the University of Chicago, you would probably be told that this is the only way to do optimal debt ratios. I'm going to talk about the pluses of that approach and some of the ways it gets misused in practice. And then I'm going to talk about how I think most companies set debt ratios, which is they look at the rest of the sector and they latch on to it. I'm going to talk about refining that approach. If that's the way you're going to decide how much to borrow, let's talk about better ways of doing it. So let's start with the cost of capital approach. The cost of capital is a hurdle rate in investment analysis. It's what you need to make for a project to be a good project. But the cost of capital actually has another use I haven't talked about. Towards the very end of this class, I'm going to value Disney, and I'm going to value Vale, and I'm going to value Tata Motors. And in valuing these companies, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to project the expected cash flows of the entire company, not on a project, but the whole company. And I'm going to discount those cash flows back at the cost of capital, and what I get as a present value will be the value of the company. It's an equation. Cash flows to the company, cost of capital is a discount rate. Let's play a little game. Let's assume I can keep the cash flows fixed. That's a Strong assumption, but let's say they remain unchanged. They're pre-debt cash flows, and that I can lower my cost of capital. Same cash flows, lower discount rate, my value is going to go up, right? If at the limit I can minimize my cost of capital, what have I done? I've maximized my firm value. So if you ask me what the right mix of debt and equity is for your company, it's that mix that minimizes your cost of capital. So what I'm going to take you through are the mechanics of how you come up with that mix. But let's do a very quick review. This should be a review because you did it for the quiz, so you should be pretty conversant with the mechanics of cost of capital. But let's see what the cost of capital is based on. First, the cost of debt is the rate at which you can borrow money long term today. Long term and today are the key numbers. So it's built off a risk-free rate plus a default spread, net of a tax benefit. The tax benefit is computed using a marginal tax rate. The cost of equity is the rate of return that a diversified investor in your company will demand as a return. What's the key about the diversified? It means that the only risk I build into the cost of equity is a risk you cannot diversify with. The weights we use are market value weights. That's the cost of capital. If you follow those mechanics, then a couple of very simple propositions follow. The first is you cannot use the dividend yield. And I used this example before, I think, you know, three or four weeks ago when we talked about cost of equity. You cannot use the dividend yield as your cost of equity because the dividend yield is only a portion of your cost of equity. It doesn't capture the price appreciation. So because you're a company that pays no dividends, don't tell me your equity is free because you still have to deliver that price appreciation. So cost of equity should deliver a rate of return well above the dividend yield. In fact, let me ask you the second question. This is actually a Almost a trick question because the answer seems to be obvious, but there are actually a couple of exceptions. Can the cost of equity for any given company be lower than its cost of debt? For, you take taxes out, even without the taxes, can the cost of equity be lower than the pre tax cost of debt? There's actually one scenario where it can be. Let's see if we can find it. What kind of company would it have to be? The what value is very high? That's, I mean, but that's, that's almost a truism, right? So you're saying people, but why are people accepting a lower cost of equity? Because remember the, the example I gave, the cost of debt 
is what the person fr in the front of the line charges. The cost of equity should be the last guy in line. Shouldn't he always charge more? I'm kind of giving you a window. What did I say drives the cost of debt? Default risk, right? What did I say drives the cost of equity? How much risk there is in the company to a diversified investor? Think about that. Can you think of a company with a lot of default risk, but where there's relatively little market risk in the company? No risk that, to a diversified portfolio. Remember the beta table I showed you? There was a negative beta company. What is it? Gold mining. And why was the gold mining beta so low? Because it's not because a gold mining company is not risky, but because the risk in a gold mining company is almost all driven by gold prices, which works against the rest of your portfolio. So if you're a diversified investor investing in a gold mining company, I'd said you'd settle for a really low cost of equity. But that gold mining company could have a lot of default risk because gold prices are all over the place. So when you lend to that gold mining company, you might actually demand a higher cost of debt. You think that's absurd. It actually makes sense. So if you're advising the CFO of a gold mining company on how he should raise money, the answer is actually pretty straightforward, right? Just use equity. Why would you even go to the bank or to bondholders to borrow money? Because equity investors are going to accept a low rate of return because your risk is almost all coming from firm-specific sources that those investors can diversify away. So that's the exception. So when the, but most of the time, the cost of equity will be higher than the pre-tax cost of debt. So let's talk about how this approach should work. And I'm going to take you back, it's making me almost scared to go back this long, 27 years. It's my first corporate finance class. And actually, the professor came in and said, today we're going to talk about the optimal debt ratio. And he said, we're going to use the cost of capital approach. And he put up a table like this one for XYZ widget company. What this fixation with widgets is, I don't know. I've never seen a widget, I don't know what it does. No, but widgets, big, big product in business schools at least. So XYZ widget company. And he showed the entire schedule. So he said, it's very easy to find the optimal debt ratio for a company. And I'll have to tell you that at the end of the session, we were deeply dissatisfied with how he described finding the optimal. Here's the story you said. As my debt ratio goes from 0 to 100%, there's actually a little problem there. A debt ratio can never be 100% for a company. And here's why. What's the definition of equity? It bears the residual risk, right? If there's nobody in the company to bear the residual risk, then how do you even have a company? So you can get to 99%. So we were willing to concede that to him. Maybe he meant a really, really high debt ratio, 99% debt. So that part, we, we, gave, we cut him some slack. Then he said, as your debt ratio goes up, your cost of equity will go up. And he told us a story. And it made sense. He said, if you're an equity investor in a company, and I borrow more money, your equity earnings get more unstable. You see why? Because I have to make those interest expenses. Therefore, equity is riskier. The cost of equity should go up. Makes sense. But then a guy in the front row, it wasn't me, put up his hand and said, why is it going up the way it is? Because if you look at the pattern, it seemed to be 0.5, then 0.6. To be quite honest, it looked like he made up the numbers. He brushed it aside and said, don't worry, it's the concept that matters. Let's keep going. Okay. Then he got to the cost of debt, and he told us a story. As you borrow more money, your cost of debt will also go up. And the story made sense, which is if you're a banker lending to a company, the more debt the company already has, the greater the default risk. So your cost of debt should go up. Again, the story made sense. Again, the same guy in the front row put up his hand and said, why is it going up the way it is? Because it seemed to be this nice, steady pattern. Again, it looked like he'd made up the numbers. He said, don't worry about it. It's a concept that matters. Then he got to the fourth column, and he computed the cost of capital, weighted average, cost of equity and cost of debt. He said, there's my cost of capital for the company. And he said, it's obvious. The optimal debt ratio for the company is where the cost of capital is minimized, which is 40% debt. And to kind of cement the process, he actually used this perpetual growth model to show us how much the value of the company would be higher with a lower cost of capital. It's trivial, right? What's a practical problem you see here? If I turned you loose on a company and said, find me the optimal debt ratio, 
How many points on the schedule or this table do you actually have? What's the only point you actually can estimate for a company? It's existing debt ratio, 73% equity, 27% debt. You can tell me what the cost to capital is at that debt ratio. You don't have a schedule, you have a number. In fact, we gave this guy such a hard time, he thought we were just dim. So he said, you don't get it, let me show it in a different way. Put it in a graph, and he said, the cost to capital is the low point on the graph. That's illuminating. The problem, though, is if you sit down again with a company, you don't have a graph, you have a point. And I remember coming out of the class saying, I need to actually write a book on corporate finance. Kind of egoistic, coming out of your first corporate. Because they said, this isn't going to help me. You turn me loose in a company. I have no idea how to get. But every corporate finance, I looked at 17 books, every single corporate finance book, every one of them had this abstract. They had this U-shaped cost of capital. It's obvious, go to the bottom of the U. None of them answer the question, how do you actually get that U-shaped cost of capital? So I'm going to take you through the process of going from that one point to the entire graph. What are the two numbers I need to get a cost of capital? I need a cost of equity. I need a cost of debt, right? In fact, the way I've approached estimating both those numbers was in preparation for this moment. How did I get the cost of equity for Disney? I took the, you don't even remember, right? I broke it down into five businesses. I got the unlevered beta of the business. I took a weighted average. Then I applied a debt to equity ratio. I came up with a levered beta 1.0013. Then I took the risk-free rate and the equity risk premium to come up with the cost of equity. In other words, I start with an unlevered beta. I used a debt to equity to come up with the levered beta. File that away, because that's going to come in as a useful tool when I change the debt ratio. How do I get the cost of debt for Disney? I looked up the rating. It was easy, single A. I used the default spread based on the trading. That default spread gave me a 1% spread. I added to the risk-free rate, and then I multiplied by 1 minus the marginal tax rate. I came up with the cost of debt. I weighted those numbers by the market value of equity and the market value of debt. So that's what I've done. So that's what I have right now. But to get to the cost of capital at every other debt ratio, I need a cost of equity, not just the existing debt ratio, but at every other debt ratio. Can I get that? How do I get the cost of equity the existing debt ratio? I start with the unlevered beta, I use the debt to equity ratio, right? So if I change my debt ratio, my debt to equity ratio will change. As my debt to equity ratio changes, and my levered beta will change. As my levered beta changes, my cost of equity will change. So that's going to be doable. Now do you see why I abandoned the regression beta approach again? If the only way you can get a beta is a regression beta, and I say, give me the beta at other debt ratios, kind of stuck. There's only one beta you have. Now because I've unlevered the beta and cleaned it up, I have a beta at every other debt ratio cost of equity. So that's going to be relatively simple. I now need a cost of debt. First time I did it, remember what I did. I had a student at S&P who was working in the ratings department and I sent him a table. And I said, I have the rating for my company at the existing debt ratio. Can you tell me what ratings S&P would give my company at 10% debt, 20% debt, 30% debt, 40% debt, 50% debt, 60%? I got the email back very quickly saying, you do it and then we'll tell you. And that's exactly the reaction. The ratings agencies are not going to give you telegraph the ratings they will give at hypothetical debt ratios. That's not their job. So that's not going to work. I can't get a rating at different debt ratios. You're stuck, right? If you didn't have a rating, remember the other way we came up with ratings for companies? What's the second approach we use? We used an interest coverage ratio. Operating income divided by interest expense, we used the interest coverage ratio to go to a lookup table and we said, if your interest coverage ratio is 4.5, you have a single A rating and this is the spread you should have. You see what I'm going to do? At different debt ratios, here's what I'm going to do. As my debt ratio goes up, my interest expense will go up, right? As my interest expense goes up, my interest coverage ratio is going to get lower. I'm going to go to the table at every debt ratio, and I'm going to tell you what synthetic rating this company will have. And guess what? As it borrows more money, its rating is going to get worse and worse, and that's going to get to reflect my cost of debt. Once I have that, I'm going to have a table just like the XYZ widget company table. But if you point to any number in that table and say, why is that number what it is? I shouldn't say, just take it for what it's conceptual. I should be able to tell you, this is how I came up with the beta for your company. So let's lay the groundwork for doing this. 
I need an unlevered beta to get the process started. There are two ways you can do it. You can take a regression beta and unlever it. Remember, we, could, we, we talked about doing this using the Jeopardy example. Or do it the right way, which is break your company down into businesses, take the unlevered beta of each business, take a weighted average. The unlevered beta that I came up with for Disney's operations was 0.9239. This is actually, I just cut and paste from that original table I had on page 72 of packet one, or 132, or whatever page it was, breaking Disney down into five businesses, the bottom up unlevered beta. That's going to be my base from which I'm going to get a levered beta at every debt ratio. For the cost of debt, I do need the operating income. So I, go, I went and collected the financials. I got the most recent fiscal year, because of the trailing 12 month numbers, and the EBITDA and the EBIT that they have is 9.45 billion in EBIT, and 12.517 billion in EBITDA was what they had in the most recent 12 months. Why do I need that? That operating income is going to be the basis that I'm going to use to judge whether I'm borrowing too much or too little. Because remember, I've got to make interest expense out of that operating income. So those are numbers that I need to get the process started. So first step, I'll take the easy half. I want to get the cost of equity at every debt ratio. The unlevered beta for Disney is 0.92319, whatever it is. So let's start with the easiest debt ratio to compute a cost of capital in, which is all equity. If I have all equity, what's my cost of capital going to be? First, what's my cost of equity going to be? It's going to be based on my unlevered beta of 0.923. I come up with the cost of equity, and I'm done, because that's all it is. So I've got my cost of capital at 0%. Say I go to 10% debt. At a 10% debt ratio, I have $10 of debt and $90 of equity. My debt to equity ratio is 10 over 90, which is 11.11%. That debt to equity ratio gives me a levered beta of 0.98. So if I seem a little fixated on this levered beta concept, and you see it repeating itself over and over in the first quiz, the second quiz, it's because it's an integral tool for you to be able to estimate what will happen to a company if it borrows more money. So my levered beta reflects a higher debt to equity ratio. My cost of equity goes up. And for the cost of equity, the risk-free rate and the equity risk premium are not changing. Disney's in exactly. That was not good. What happened when you're half blind to? Let's see, let's hope and pray I got it in the right way. Oh, okay, there you go. So, thank you. <laughs> I remember I, there was, uh, I hate podiums for one reason. I remember about 10 years ago, I was teaching on a podium and I fell right off and I kept talking. Because <laughs> I couldn't stop. So basically at each debt ratio, I'm computing the debt to equity ratio. I'm coming up with a levered beta, and I, I'm coming up with the cost of equity. Half the table is done. What's the other half? I need a cost of debt. So if you look at my cost of equity, it starts at 8.07%, and it ends at 38.5%. So let me ask you a very simple question. If a CFO asked you, what debt ratio should I have to minimize my cost of equity? What's the answer always going to be? Zero. If your objective is minimizing the cost of equity, never borrow money. It's only if you want to minimize your cost of capital that debt becomes a player in this game. So what I'm going to do actually is take you through the cost of debt calculation. And I'm going to do it by hand. You're saying as opposed to what? I'm actually going to give you an Excel spreadsheet that will do this for your company from zero to 90%, but I don't want it to become a black box. So I'm going to take you through the process by which I constructed the spreadsheet. So you can see how I'm going to come up with the cost of debt at every debt ratio. So here's the first thing to remember. Whenever you look at this question of how much should I borrow, you're looking at what's called a recapitalization question. So think of it this way. You've got a financial balance sheet. You've got assets on one side. You've got debt and equity in the other, right? So all you're doing is changing the mix of debt and equity for your company, holding your assets fixed. You're saying, why am I doing that? Because if I let you borrow money and take projects with that money, Guess what's going to happen? They're going to create operating income. There's going to be a secondary impact. Here I want to isolate the effect of just changing a mix of debt and equity. That sounds abstract, but here's how it plays out. I'm going to actually try to compute what my cost of debt is going to be at 10% debt. 
So let's start off the easy. If I have no debt, of course I have a AAA rating, my cost of equity is my cost of capital, I'm done. If I decide to go from no debt to 10%, the first question I need to answer, so I'm going to go through the sequence. The first question I need to answer is, how much do I need to borrow to get to a 10% debt ratio? To answer that question, I'm going to take the existing market value of equity for Disney, 121.9 billion, and the existing market value of debt. And you know what's in that market value of debt? Market value of interest-bearing debt plus the present value of leases. So once I decide to do that, from this point on, that debt includes the leases. I add those two numbers up, I get a total value for the company of 138 billion. Why do I need that? To go to a 10% debt ratio, I need to borrow 10% of 138 billion. That's what you see that 13.784 billion is 10% of my overall value of the firm. So start with the value of the company, take 10% of that. My EBITDA and depreciation remain exactly the same. You're saying, but I borrowed all this money, why aren't they changing? Because when I borrow money in a recapitalization, what comes in through one window has to go out through another window, which means that whatever money I borrow has to be used to do what? I either have to pay a dividend or I have to buy back stock. That's why it's called a recapitalization. I borrow money and I put it out of the other window. I'm just changing the mix of debt and equity. So my EBITDA and DAS stay the same. My EBIT is 10,032 million. That's my base operating income. And my interest expense is now based on the $13.8 billion in debt. I'm going to go through the sequence. I have a little problem here. Let's see if you can isolate what that problem is. We get the interest expense. I take the dollar debt, 13784 and I multiply by my interest rate. I come up with an interest expense. I divide the operating income by the interest expense. I come up with a coverage ratio of 23.1. I turn to the next page. I've got my lookup table for large market cap companies because Disney is one. 21 point or whatever I got in the previous page is way above 8.5. So the rating I give Disney is AAA. And the default spread that goes with that rating was 40 basis points, which gave me a cost of debt at 3.15%. Let me list the sequence and you tell me where the problem is. I started with the dollar debt, right? I multiplied the dollar debt by the interest rate to come up with the interest expense. I divided the EBIT by the interest expense to come up with the coverage ratio. I used the coverage ratio to come up with the rating. I used the rating to come up with an interest rate. Where's the problem? In step two, I need an interest rate to get the interest expense. And in step five, I need the interest expense to get an interest rate. This is a classic circular logic problem or a chicken and the egg problem. I don't know whether there's a solution to the chicken and the egg problem, but for this one, I do have a solution. And it's going to be manual. So to show you what the solution is, I'm going to try a different debt ratio. And you're going to help me out here. Okay? So what we're going to try to do is compute the cost of debt at 30%. You're going to see exactly where the problem comes about, because we actually have to compute the numbers. Okay? So I know I've given you the 20% debt ratio, and now you're sitting there saying, I want to compute the cost of debt at 30%. So let's start easy. If my debt ratio is 30%, what's my debt to equity ratio? 30 over 70, which is like 42%. So let's round it up, say that's my debt to equity ratio. So $30 of debt, $70 of equity. How much dollar debt would I need to get? Jesus, I'm falling apart here. To get to a 30% debt ratio. I have 27,500. How did I get the dollar debt at 10%? I took 10% of 137. All I need to do is add 13,768 million to 20. So basically, it's another 13. I think it's like 41,302. Don't take my numbers as a given, but I think it is 41,302. So that's my dollar debt. It's basically an extra 10% increment. Now comes the two easy numbers. You can relax. What's my habit done? Depreciation, amortization going to be at 30%? They're going to be the same. So basically, the EBITDA and the DAS stay the same. The EBIT stays the same. Now you get to that cell of an interest expense. You see the problem? I know I'm going to have $41.3 billion of debt if I get to 30%, but I don't have an interest rate at 30% because I don't know what it is. So let's cheat. I know what the interest rate is at 20%, right? It's 3.15%. I know it's completely unrealistic, but let's assume that you can finance this new debt at the old interest rate. 
the bank would be stupid to do it but let's say you let it let you do it the interest expense you're going to have is going to be 1300 so basically it's going to be scaled up by so 20% was 868 million at 30% it's going to be 1302 million i know it's real unrealistic but let's leave that it's too low right because i've assumed that the interest rate stays the same i use that interest expense to come up with the coverage ratio coverage ratio i think i come up with if i take 10032 and divide by 1302 is like 7.5 the actual numbers are actually at the bottom. I'll, I'll show you in a minute 7.5 turn back to the previous page and tell me what my rating will be if my interest coverage ratio is 7.5 double a is it double a a plus at 7.5 ah, it's double a Right, so I'm right at 6.5 to 8.5. My default spread is 7%. My interest rate is 3.45%. We have a problem. Do you see what the problem is? When I computed the interest expense, what interest rate did I use? I used 3.15%. And now at the bottom of the table is saying, you know what, I screwed up. It should really be 3.45%. So what should I fix? What's the one number that's wrong? My interest expense is too low. So you see the second iteration? You're going to go back and recompute the interest expense using a 7.45, I'm sorry, 3.45% rate. The interest expense goes to 1,368. It rises because I have a high interest rate. I recompute the interest coverage ratio, and I get 7.02. It's lower now because I have high interest expenses. Then I very gingerly turn to the previous page and hope and pray that what hasn't happened, that I haven't slipped a notch, in which case I have to do a third iteration. I have some good news and I have some bad news. The good news is I've never had to do more than three iterations. The bad news is sometimes I have to do three iterations. But remember, you're computing the optimal debt ratio for a $130 billion company. I don't know how much you value your time at, but I think I can afford to spend an hour and a half, if need be, to fill the entire schedule. It will save somebody $6 billion. If your time is priced at more than $2 billion an hour, <laughs> I think you could do it manually. But Excel actually offers an even quicker option. I don't know whether you've ever gone into calculation options in Excel. There's little, you know, this, there are all these choices. And there's a box that, allow, that says iterations. If you check that box off, Excel will actually do this for you. You know what the default in Excel is for how many iterations it does? 2,000. This is overkill, because I said I've never had to do more than three. But after three, it just spins around. It does nothing. It takes it no time at all. So when you open the spreadsheet, and I will send you the spreadsheet and enter the numbers for your company, if that iteration box is not checked, Excel will go crazy on you. You know how it, what it does with circular reasoning, right? It starts drawing lines over the spreadsheet. Don't try to fix the problem. It's not a problem. It's a feature, not a bug. There is supposed to be circular reasoning here because my end game at the end of this process is to come with a final iteration. So what you're going to see as your final, the, the numbers for Disney at each debt ratio, this is the last iteration, is as my debt goes up, my interest expense goes up more than proportionately. Why? Because my interest rate rises. As my interest expense goes up, my coverage ratio collapses. As my coverage ratio collapses, Disney's rating, which starts at AAA, goes all the way down to C. You're saying, Disney with a single C rating, you borrow enough money, you can make any company a C-rated company. And it's happening at really high debt ratios. So when we start on Monday, we're going to start looking at coming up with the after-tax cost today and bringing it all together in a cost of capital table. market prices the company correctly and it's a stable growth company with no growth no growth then the only so how many companies 
I say the growth companies that are correctly priced, and I'm no good. You're basically pricing a bot. Companies are not banks. If you buy red reason, you know what the cost of equity for the US, for a typical US company right now should be, right? The community ratio of US companies for US companies collectively is 25. One over 25 is 4%. The cost of equity is definitely not 4%. So don't use it approximation. It's an awful approximation. I see people using it. It comes from the dividend discount model and making growth zero. If you make growth zero, dividends become earnings. And you can put earnings to price as your approximation for the cost of equity. Very small subject. So be careful. Most of that convertible preferred is not even preferred. It's conversion option. It's really an equity option. I don't even know why they call it convertible preferred. You might as well just call it warrants. In the U.S., for some reason, there is this deep-set desire never to use the word warrants. Because if you're a startup and you're issuing convertible preferred, 95% of the value is coming from the conversion option. The preferred is kind of a rump instrument. But, but for the startup, it's a bad thing compared to debt, right? They, they, I mean, because they cannot borrow probably, right? Because the cost of borrowing is... It shouldn't be compared to debt. It should only be compared to debt. So really the question you should ask is, why are you issuing convertible preferred when it might be cheaper for you to give up? Because what happens is the owners don't want to explicitly give away a piece of the business, so they, implic they prefer to actually implicitly give away 21% of the business by giving it as a conversion option than explicitly giving 15%. That makes no sense to me, but it's psychological. Because with the option, you actually are not technically giving it away till the option gets exercised, but that's exactly what you're doing when you give away conversion options that are mispriced. But it's really more psychological than anything else. I don't know why convertible preferred has become such a deeply entrenched part of the VC business, but I think part of the reason is VCs know they're getting a great deal with convertible preferred with founders. Because founders say, I'm giving away 15% of my equity. You see this actually on Shark Tank when sometimes people yeah. frame their offers. Like Kevin is very clever about saying, I'll take only 3% of your equity, but I'll take 7% of $7 for every item you sell. And, and, the, and the guys will say, oh, it's only 3% of my equity.